Application Longevity for Dummies with Rod Paddock. The Azure DevOps Podcast is a show for developers and DevOps professionals shipping software using Microsoft technologies. Each show brings you hard-hitting interviews with industry experts, innovating better methods, and sharing success stories. Listen on to learn how to increase quality, ship quickly, and operate well. And now your host, Jeffrey Palermo. Welcome to the show. I'm Jeffrey Palermo, your host for helping you and your teams move fast, deliver quality, and to run your software with confidence in Azure, all while using everything that the .NET ecosystem has to offer. The podcast is sponsored by ClearMeasure, a software architecture company that empowers .NET teams to be self-sufficient and able to deliver world-class results. They are hiring architects and .NET engineers who'd like a path to become an architect. So you can go to clearmeasure.com slash careers. And my guest today on the show is a returning guest, Rod Paddock. Uh, and he, is, uh, he has a company called Dashpoint Software. He's also the editor-in-chief of Code Magazine uh, in in 2001, Rod founded Dashpoint Software to help uh, d- develop high-quality custom software solutions and over 30-plus, uh, we'll just stop counting, years of experience. Uh, some of his current and past clients include Six Flags, First Premier Bank, Microsoft, Calamos Investments, U.S. Coast Guard, Navy, um, and along with developing software, he's also a well-known author and conference speaker. Since 1995, he's given talks and training sessions and keynotes in the U.S., Canada, and Europe, and probably another continent he's forgotten about. But uh, Rod was also a guest uh, way back on the show in episode 111, so you can you can go back in the archives and listen to his, his podcast there. But Rod, welcome back to the show. How are you, sir? Hey, doing good. How are you doing this morning? I'm good. I'm good. Um, I was, we were talking before the show, we, we only live about an hour's drive away from each other, <laughs> but, uh, you, even that in the past season, besides just kind of getting together with longtime friends, uh, uh, the, uh, the state of remote work has, has kind of changed over the last few years. But before we get into that, there, there's probably plenty of listeners who, uh, you know, haven't seen you speak or whatnot and, 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 and. Uh, are getting to know you for the first time. Um, what are some of the memorable, memorable things in, in your indus- in your career that's kind of led you up to what you're working on today? Memorable things in my career that I, for three thousand dollars, Wink. That's right. Um, I've been lucky. I, I uh, my speaking career started way, way, way back in the day, and actually, I have a, I have a number of funny, silly stories that I have from way back then. Um, when I became, when I, when I, when I got rid of my real job and I became a consultant, so I was no longer, no long, no longer had a real, real job, um, and entered the consulting business, I started teaching. And there was a company that I started teaching with called application developers training company, ADTC. And these guys basically carpet bombed mailing lists that they got from Microsoft with these pamphlets they would mail you know this is in the days of mail yeah not when everything got emailed to you and uh so all of our little mug shots were on these things and and the list of people that you were would know runs the gamut of people that you know now that are all over the industry uh paul sheriff is one paul litwin i think works at microsoft now um uh, Richard Campbell was a trainer. If you know you know, one of your quote unquote podcasting yeah. competitors and friend of yours, he was a trainer with the company. So a lot of us were in this circuit. We were teaching things like Visual Basic 6. And I was teaching Fox Pro for Windows. This is before the Visual Fox Pro era. And then we moved into Visual Fox Pro. The early 90s, roughly? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it would have been really at the high point of EV5, maybe we were doing at that point. We're also teaching Access and and all kinds of fun stuff. Um, so anyway, so through connections or through, I, I don't know how it ever happened. I get a call from Microsoft going, uh, we had somebody bail and we want you to come and present on this new product that we have called back office, which at that point was SQL server. I think it was 4.2, maybe it was six. 
uh, it was exchange. It was a bunch of other stuff. So anyway, and, and you have two days to build a whole presentation oh, on wow. half the stuff you don't even know about. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I got to come in. You guys have to help me build it. So I roll into Microsoft. I spend two days with them building the deck, learning how to do all this stuff. And then I give a talk. Um, at the Visual Fox Pro Developers Conference in San Diego, which was a big deal then. It's like Bob Muglia was the keynote who went on to found a company called Snowflake, if you've ever heard of that. So, and this was the big ta-da when Microsoft dumped a bunch of money on the Fox Pro product. So the funny story, and that's just that's just a luck thing. I was in the right place at the right time. You got to give a talk, you know, among these people. There were two awesome things at that event. The, one of the coolest things is where we got to have the speaker dinner that night. And I will tell you, hands down right now, no speaker dinner will ever top where I had my speaker dinner that night. Guaranteed, okay. bring it on, entire world. We got to have dinner at Miramar. And if you remember what Miramar is, Miramar is a naval air base. Oh, and that the naval Miramar. air base where they do this thing called Top Gun. Yeah. So we got to have dinner with Top Gun pilots at our tables. Nice. So all these guys, they we had a huge spread, killer dinner. We got to go climb an F4. We didn't get to fly in them, you know, unfortunately. But we got to climb up and sit inside F14s. So that was wicked cool. Nice. Um, so that's one of the that's one of the awesome fun event stories that that I've been fortunate enough. I consider myself extremely fortunate in my whole career. I'm really honestly about that. Um, and then the second one, which is kind of the funny, dumb celebrity kind of deal, I'm riding in the elevator at my hotel. And one of the people in the elevator, he elbows his wife and goes, that's Rod Paddock. I'm like, what? <laughs> like, okay. And I'm, I'm trying to piece together, how do you know who I am by my face? Not because I was speaking, because I'm in the silly brochure that went out to half a million people or something like that. So <laughs> it was like, that and $3 would get you Starbucks, right? It's like, okay. So that was that was one of the funny, stupid events. So anyway, so it's kind of interesting as kind of three different things. And this is very early on in my career. You know, just to let you know, SQL Server 4260 era, that's how far back this went. Yeah. Um, but, you know, in, in terms of between now and then, I've had a lot of great, awesome experiences. I've been to Germany to speak. Um, I did work in Amsterdam for a week and rode the train and back and forth to work doing Fox Pro code. I'm a long-term Fox Pro developer, not doing it anymore. Actually, I still run it because I have clients that have data in it. So I actually, last week I was in Fox Pro, believe it or not. Yeah. Um, but I have this old adage and there's a whole bunch of us, Marcus that owns the magazine and Rick Straw, who's a very famous web developer guy, very knowledgeable, one of the most knowledgeable people in .NET that I know. We're all Fox Pro heads. Yeah. So uh, we all talk about, we all live in the houses that Fox Pro built because we're all started consulting and we've done right. rock and wood. Okay. Sure. So anyway, that's been a good thing. So that's kind of, I don't know if that's what you're looking for. Yeah. Those are some of the funny stories. And, and for the people who, who get Code Magazine, they see, you know, they see your mug in there all the time. And for those who, who don't get Code Magazine, am I going too far on a limb to say... There's no reason not to, that they should just go and sign up. Go sign up. We're, yeah. we, we, I think they have a lot of free subscription stuff. I don't handle the business end of it, but I know that there's lots of free subscriptions. And I bet if we ping a couple people, we can get you a code and people can get, well, let's do that. We'll get, I'll see if I can get you guys a code that you're, you can put it in your podcast notes and people can sign up for a free subscription. Yeah. So nobody, nobody say anything, but I've, I've run enough user groups where, None of the user groups have actually had to pay. They've always gotten, you know, some free codes. So pretty much. <laughs> yeah, whisper, yep. whisper. So it's a good, you know, honestly, it's a good magazine. And I have I have a I have a long, long history with the magazine. And I have been the editor in chief of the thing for I think going on 20 years now. I got hired over instant messenger. Um I've which, known which Marcus. One? Which instant messenger? ICQ. <laughs> there you go, baby. ICQ. Everybody knows that noise when it, when you hear it, you know it, right? You know that noise. There's that's an unmistakable for any of us that were around in the early days of the of the internet. Yeah, I was on ICQ. Um, Marcus hired me, and uh, but the interesting story is in terms of subscribers, I was the first paid subscriber to the magazine before I was the editor. We were nice. all at a conference. 
and they started they started taking subscriptions and i ran over there and i said here's the credit card i'm so do, do you have any subscribers yet that have paid you yeah no and i said good i'm number one so i was the first <laughs> person to pay for this i don't pay for it anymore obviously right, right. um but we 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 cater to more than just the dot net crowd we run a very very long list of languages and technologies um you know, one of the ones that I find really interesting that we've been running lately is this thing called Laravel, hmm. which is a, essentially a .NET, or .NET uh, an ASP stack built on PHP. And I look at the code in PHP, it's like that language has come a long way since I, a long yeah. way over the years. Yeah. It's a, it looks, it's extremely interesting looking language now. And obviously it's never gone anywhere because it runs, it runs the backbone of so much of the internet. Because of WordPress. <laughs> no, um, yeah, WordPress, but also because Facebook is built on oh, PHP yeah. as well. Yeah. Although it's a different level. I think they actually have things that turn PHP into C++ code. And they have these weird recompiler things that are out there. So. so you do tons of consulting with all kinds of clients. Um, it, it, that world has is, is, is totally changed. Um, what's your observations on how remote work versus going back in the office? What are you seeing out there? Um, it's a very interesting one. I just I, I watch. I have probably half a dozen projects going on at any given time. Some of them are just long term clients that have maintenance work, or others are really long term, lots of work kind of clients. Um, I can tell you one of them that's been a very interesting transformation is one of my clients in California. Um, they had an office that had somewhere somewhere upwards of a hundred people in it. Um, they were bursting at the seams, and then. The event happened, COVID, and they are, everybody scattered and they reconfigured their whole infrastructure to have a remote workforce. And so the interesting aspect of it is that the owner of the company, um, she has learned now that we don't have to be in the office to do what we do effectively. Um, so she spends her time split between offices in California and she bought a condominium in uh, in. Seattle to be closer to her daughter. And then I was gabbing with her marketing director and where I, she, I'm like, are you going to fly up from LA to have these meetings in Seattle that we're at next week? She's like, Oh no, I moved to Seattle. So I had no idea that this person that I interact with on teams every other day moved from Hermosa beach, California to Seattle because they're dispersed. Yeah. So their entire their entire workforce has been dispersed, and they have no desire to go back to the concept of making people commute into the office. Yeah. Although we are having meetings, it's just selective meetings. It's let's get together. I don't care what people say when you're in the room with people with a whiteboard and a couple of pens, and you can freeform communications yeah. through the room. You can do a lot of creative stuff. It's all quality time because then when you're there. It's not the main the humdrum meetings that you just go to just for the sake of me. We do all those remotely now. So, but but uh, I'm finding now this is what this is the case is that we're starting to get back together, but it's selective when we do it, and it's very very focused, high productivity time. It's really quality time. So we're on a big greenfield project for them now that we're just starting and we've had two meetings so far and we're on a monthly cadence. So I, I'm on planes again, which I actually don't mind. I like being gone. Uh, my wife appreciates me being gone <laughs> now and again. I got tired of staring at the four walls of my office at home uh, every day. And so that there's that, there's that. So their whole workforce is dispersed. People, their lifestyle is a lot better because in, in the Los Angeles area, everybody commutes. There's an old there's an old missing person song called Nobody Walks in LA and it's 100% true. Nobody does. Everybody commutes. Nobody lives like New York City where you ride the subway 4 miles to work. Yeah. Everybody drives 60 miles to work, which is an hour to two every day. So the, lots of people are getting essentially 20 hours a week back just not commuting, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Um and then, you know, there's all kinds of advantages. The 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 big difference for me is it's not a huge amount of difference because I've been a consultant for a long time and I've always worked. I've had times where I've had offices out of the house um, just for different things. I actually, I really liked WeWork. Um, I did that for quite a while and I'm, I'm going to start using that again, just to break it up. You have to kind of get out of the, where you're at. 
and get your creativity flowing in. So anyway, pretty much all my clients are remote if they can be. Um, I'm trying to think of any of them that aren't in one way, shape or form another, but in the tech industry, we've done a lot of remote work anyway, Mm -hmm. um, for a long time, you know? Right. Well, you're, you're planning some new applications as well. And before the, before the show, you kind of said, all right, I've got, I've got a couple more big hurrahs left in me and, and you're planning for these applications to live multiple decades. And I recognize that a lot of developers have maybe built some applications, but haven't had a chance to see their code live for multiple decades. They've just seen maybe inherited somebody else's multiple decade code and like ripped their hair out. So what, what is, what is your experience and what, what is your process to go through to, to plan for applications that live a long time and make sure that these are good applications that don't just end up as trash that other developers down the road want to throw away and start over. Um, yeah, this was actually kind of a fun, fun topic. And it's actually one that that's new. So this is actually going to be the, um, going back to code magazine real quick. I'll let you know kind of where this, these thoughts pop into my head. Cause I'm always thinking about building software, how people build software, creativity and software and everything else. So I write an editorial every issue. So every other month I have to crank out about a thousand words on something. Yeah. And it's hard. Everybody thinks, Oh, let's, I want to write. Everybody asks me when they come write for me for code magazine, can I do a column? It's like, yeah, write six articles for me for six issues in a row without me asking you. And then I'll consider because it's hard. Yeah. It's not as easy. Everybody thinks they can write a column. It's like, yeah, you're good for one or two because you have a couple of thoughts and then you're done. And then I have to find somebody else. But anyway, so my editorial that I thought of is, and I, and, and the title, the title is, I'm going to be a little long on this one, but uh, I want to make sure I under, explain the context of it. Um, it's going to be, these are my last applications. So we, you talked about how long I've been consulting. I'm 53, I, and I don't care about age or anything like that. I've been doing this for a long time. I started my consulting business in my early 20s. I was the young gun at the time, yeah. you know, of that crowd. And now I'm not. I'm, you can see on the camera because we're on video. My hair is a lot grayer, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm 53 years old. And I built, and so I'm saying that the, I have some greenfield applications that are coming up that are going to be very sizable, very important to the businesses that we're building them for. Um, and, I, and I came to the conclusion, it's like, these are going to be my last big ones, probably. And I don't want to say they're the last things I'm going to work on because they're definitely not because I'm not old enough to stop yet. Yeah. But what's going to happen is these applications are going to live for a long time. And I kind of, when we started, I was kind of telling you how kind of how I, how I quote unquote date these applications, how old are they? And I, I treat them like children. So I have two applications right now that are entering the third grade. (laughs) <laughs> right. I have one client, the application's nine years old. I guess nine years old is probably almost fourth grade, that's, right? Yep. Third, third or fourth third, grade. Fourth grade. That's right. Right. Right in there. So getting out of third, going into fourth grade. So I have two of them. I actually open up the databases and I look at the first records that got written. I'm like, oh my God, these things are that old. Yeah. I had an application that we we rewrote in uh in the dot net stack. Uh it was I think it was a couple of years ago that it got done, right? Pre-COVID is when it kind of rolled out. Um it was almost of drinking age. Totally. So it was, yeah, we could have taken that application to the bar for drinks. It was a le- it was legal to drink. In some countries, it was definitely legal to drink. But in the States, it's 21 years of age to drink, right? That application lived 21 years. And I was floored to think about how long it, it survived. And so I'm using that as my barometer in terms of these applications I'm building. They're mission-critical apps for these businesses. And they're going to outlive my career. They will live 20 years or more, very likely. And I guarantee you when I'm 73 years old, I'm not going to be slinging code. Well, I might. Now, I like doing what I do, but I can see myself traveling. And you know, 73 years old, I'm probably going to be retired, you know, hopefully. Um, or dabbling or just, you know, pure consult. I don't know what I'm going to be doing. You'll be, anyway, advi- you'll be advising over Zoom because you like to talk to people. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> you know, hopefully. Hopefully. You know, and I don't know. Yeah. Part anyway, time. it'll be interesting. I don't know where where the roads are going to take me then, but that gives me context when I'm building these applications. And you never realize 
how long you're, because we just build applications and we put them out into the wild and you really don't know how they're being used or for what, because you build them a lot of times for a customer. Um, one of these applications I was talking about is a piece of museum software that is nine years old and has 1200 museums in it. And we started with five, you know, and, and over the nine years, they've added 1200 to it. And I'm like, you have to be kidding me. There's there's that many in this thing. And this one, we actually just rewrote it. So we were moving it out of Ruby on Rails into, into .NET with, for reasons, just because of support and stuff mm -hmm. like that, because yeah. they don't have enough Linux help. Yeah. Ruby's kind of legacy at this point. I mean, in a lot uh, of places. Just from a support perspective and market share and developer uh, availability. That's a whole other story yeah, for a whole other podcast. <laughs> So that, I'm gonna get there, there's now. a whole there, there's a whole, it, 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 there's there's a new term it's called stack shaming right so oh yeah <laughs> and there's Fair a lot enough. of stack shaming that goes on with the youngsters right that oh my god I'm what I, anyway that's another another pod we'll do it another day um talk about stack shaming. hey you've got clients that have fox pro that's still gonna live for another couple decades <laughs> i've got clients they with access never gonna, that's never gonna go away yeah. <laughs> no because these things are very, very expensive to replace. Yeah. And it's very hard to re rewriting applications is a lot of times harder than building them from the ground up. Yeah. Because then when you redo them, you have to put all that quirky logic back in there that may or may not have been a bug, but it, that's how it works today and needs to continue working. That way. Many thanks to our podcast sponsor, Clear Measure. Clear Measure is a software architecture company that empowers clients' development teams to be self sufficient, moving fast delivering quality and running their systems with confidence. Whether starting a new project or developing new technologies or techniques, Clear Measure sets up your team to deliver world-class results. Learn more at www.clearmeasure.com. Clear Measure, empowering software delivery. And every listener needs to read Fred Brooks's uh, The Second System Effect. That old essay from his Mythical Man Month book. <laughs> but those forces yep. don't change. Yeah, let's keep adding junk to the thing. And, well, that's what happens is these applications, if you build them right, you don't add junk to them. They just keep growing and growing and growing. And then, yeah. you know, you're hopefully you can replace the pieces that theoretically you needed to replace. And I've had it happen. So I, I have a whole editorial on it. There was an HTML5 feature that we used that went away. They, had, they used to have SQLite kind of baked into the web browsers. And that went away, like almost overnight. And so luckily, I'd built all my stuff with a common set of middleware for this. I had this form router tool. So it's always a theory that I can replace these things. Yeah. And then until you, meet, until you meet the enemy, as they say in Sun Tzu, you don't know. Your plans are great until you meet the enemy the first time, right? Isn't that Sun Tzu, the art of war, one of the topics? Yeah. I think, I think Mike Tyson translated it. Uh, you you got to plan until you get punched in the face. <laughs> <laughs> Every, everybody has a plan yes <laughs> anyway so you try and plan and then you hope that your plans work right you hope that those things that you laid down there were common middleware or common repository classes or common whatever that you can tear the guts out and replace them on a moving vehicle as it's going because that's a lot of times what these are they're moving vehicles that you have to yeah. you have to repair them in flight you know you don't have a long window to do it so I don't know that there's really a science to that. I think there's a lot of thought and there's a lot of ways to build. So, um, and there's a little bit of luck involved. So hopefully, you know, that's one. And I, I don't know if there's, you can plan for that, but you, you need to anticipate that these things are going to live a long time. And then refactoring is important. So it's like, when do you bite the bullet and rebuild pieces of the code that you know? So we have one of my clients, we have our own workflow system. And it got to be so far bailing wired and bubble gum together. It's like, because you start with like, oh, we need to do X and Y, right? We'll just make it do X and Y. And when X finishes, we'll just have it trigger Y. Well, it's like, okay, now we need to do X, Y, and Z. So when X finishes, we need to do Y. But if it's in this stack, we have to do Python running. If it's in that stack, you have to do SAS for statistics. It's like, okay, so now I got these branches. So it's like, well, I'll put another couple if statements, if X, Y, boom, boom, boom. It's like, well, oh, by the way, we got this fourth thing we need to do in part of this process. Okay, pause, time to stop. As soon as you, you have to notice these, there's patterns, these anti-patterns that you find. And they're not anti-patterns initially, because sometimes they're just, they work, 
and eventually they will turn into an anti-pattern. And you'll know you'll you have to pay attention. You have to go, I can't do this anymore because the costs are getting way too high. When we add the fifth thing, then my branching is out. So two months ago, we sat down, we said we have all these processes. How can we do this better? So we essentially said, okay, we're going to make all these things. Little, we're going to build a work. We built our own kind of queuing workflowing system. We build what we call recipes. You know, do A, do B, do C, and we did it on the worst day of the week possible. So we do all this processing on a Wednesday. But it was mm. the only day that me and the developer that worked on it together could. We had to roll it all out at one time. We couldn't roll a piece. You had to do it all in one shot. So we sat in a hotel room at LAX. And we, we knew our windows of time during the day that were the safer times. So it's like the, the flows run, but there's like our windows in the middle of the day. It's like, okay, yeah. shut them all down, put the code out, turn them all on, and let's see how we do it. And so it, it, by the end of the day, it was all work. We replaced the entire engine of the truck running during the day. And one of our, our managers there, ops managers, she's like, why did you do that during the day today? Well, don't ever do that again. It's like, you know what? We know we never do this. We never do it on, on a Wednesday. Wednesday is the worst day possible. We never do it. We did because it was the only day that worked. For some reason, our calendars, had, we had to do it. Then. So we mitigated it. But long story short, that thing, that workflow system was built to solve the cruft that we had from band-aiding this thing together over years, right? So that's the, that you have to plan, anticipate, you have to, you have to pay attention to the, the way you're building your applications and that helps, helps the longevity as well. And knowing the pieces that you can rip out and rebuild. Now, the cool thing about this is, is because we tore that whole thing out, now we've augmented the new thing a lot. So to replay an old workflow, you had to start at the beginning and run through the whole flow. So now the way we did the stack is you can say, I want to start this workflow now from step seven instead of work going through the first six steps to get to seven. And we couldn't have done that without tearing the engine out and rebuilding it. But we didn't know to rebuild the engine until it got pain. It, 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 I guess it's just understanding pain. You have to understand that you're just doing ceremony to make it work. But a lot of times that's the reality. You have, you have to get it done and move on, but you have to take the time and notice where your problems are. I think that's probably one of the biggest things is knowing where your pain is. And every system has pain. You know, they always do because they live a long time. And your assumptions that you make in the beginning change later on. You yeah. know, your business changes. You know, we had to change a search engine now where we were using solar before. And now we're using Elasticsearch on Amazon or they call it open search now. So those parameters change. And then building, converting websites is a really interesting problem because people bookmark your site. Mm -hmm. And those bookmarks that were URLs. in a Ruby pattern before, you have to continue to work. So you do a lot of URL rewriting or you make sure your controller methods work exactly the same way. Right. Luckily, MVC, the way most of the vendors have kept that consistent usually. So that's an easier problem to solve now. If you have really old pieces of software um, and they've been running, serving serving those businesses, so you finished those old pieces of software. You started them and finished them and now they're running and you got them into a situation where it didn't require you babysitting them every day for all these years. I see, I see systems out there where companies have them and then they have to have a full-time developer just to keep it working because of various things that happen that what is what, what's your thought process been to make these these applications that have run for all these years and you're not chained to them that's a very that's an interesting question um i am chained to them but i try and make them where they don't require care and feeding well that's what they i just miss. they do they just yeah. they just have to run they don't always run. And then generally I get called in when they quit in the middle of the night or, you know, whatever. Um, it has to do with laziness, really. Uh, laziness is a good quality among a software developer. I don't want to do it. I don't want to manually run these things. So I generally build the tools that put the things that I don't want to run in the end user's hands and let them do it and give them the 
a lot of these systems, you know, I think one of the things that people don't really appreciate in the world is that there's lots of people in the background keeping things alive. And I've worked in the banking industry and you'd be surprised at how much care and feeding giant systems have because things just break for no reason whatsoever. An integration point breaks, something you didn't anticipate breaks, whatever. Um, but I think it has to do with, some of it has to do with laziness. And I also, I try and make the software, uh, I'm tr- I don't even know. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I'm just trying to find an answer to the question. Well, you said put control in the user's hands. Yeah. How, how do, So you're planning these two new long-live applications. How does that manifest? What do you mean control in the user's hands? Like we have an automated scheduling system to run workflows and inevitably a piece of the automated system will die. It'll die in the middle. So they have a couple of choices. They can call us to reschedule the job or we give them applications of the user interface to manually fire a job off themselves. We say, just go to the portal, pick this option, put the options in and fire it off and it'll just run. So outside of the schedule, which I don't control, because there's lot, there's like operation stuff that goes on inside of clients that I do my best to stay out of it. I don't want to be in the operational flow of their stuff because it's really difficult for me to do that. It's just, it's really hard as a consultant because I'm gone. I'm at a client, I'm at a meeting. Yeah. And when your order processing system breaks in the middle of the day or need, or something didn't run, you have to give them the tools to do it. To, to start that thing up. So I think a lot of it's just building and they're not, they don't have to be glamorous tools or bulletproof tools. They have to be expert level tools where it's like, if you have access to the screen, you know what you're doing. Theoretically, yeah. I hope you know what you're doing because we put the, we, we put the weapon in your hand and we hope you know how to use it properly, that you feed the parameters in the right way. So a lot of it is just exposing just enough of the guts to let them manage the, th- the system. And then if that doesn't work, then they can call you. So you kind of build these escalation points in, I guess, where it's like, here's the things you need to try. Did you try X? Did you try Y? Okay, fine. I'll jump on and I'll help you now because something's not right. Yeah. Or the other thing that we do too, is we have lots of, I'm not, uh, we have telemetry in there, but not telemetry in the, in a, in a metric sense. We have telemetry and when stuff dies, it alerts us. Like we have heartbeats. Heartbeats is a, a key thing that we have. We have processes that run that check in. When was the last time this heartbeat hit? And if the heartbeats get out of parameter, we get emails. So a lot of times we've already solved problems for the clients before they even know it. Because it's like we got the heart, the heartbeat died. It's like, well, that server did something or it, you know, Windows update died in the middle or who knows what. Yeah. But we know we have we you have to put logging and telemetry are huge things. And that a lot of people don't do it. I'm actually kind of surprised in it. And I'm a late adopter to the, to the logging thing. But um, over the last number, of, you know, probably 10 years, logging is like essential. Just so you know what your system's doing. You know, I like logging on because I, I just go into certain screens and, and just check the system and go, okay. And then as you get your logs, you get more sophisticated. You know, I want timings in my logs. So now I can do more than just did it run. How fast did it run? So is it out of my out of band you can start doing stuff like that so i guess i there are answers to this question it's a, it's a deep <laughs> question it's like it kind of caught me out of left field but um yeah that, that those are things that, that we do well, some other companies might think oh there i gotta have some people that are ops and and the ops people they have access to reschedule jobs and look at logs and all that but you're saying no no, no, no. give it to the users let them let them be more self service where it's where it fits. They know they know they know what's going on better than you do. The users do because they're in charge of dealing with the customers that go. My poor my reports didn't show up this morning. Why? Yeah, you know, I think every every company has ops. It just is it a formal title or not? Yeah, ninety nine percent of the time <laughs> it's not formal. It's everybody's got ops because they're a business and they have people that know what's going on. Hopefully, they're yeah. not just willy nilly not. So. Right, right. I, I run across probably a couple of companies every year that have never built some custom software for themselves, and they're always you know they have this idea, and they have they have uh, no concept of budgeting for development or ops of this thing after they built. It. They're thinking, okay, I'm gonna allocate a chunk of money, it's going to be built, and then I'm going to be finished spending money on this. 
or, you know, and, and, uh, I have to kind of talk them through <laughs> what's your ongoing budget. They don't realize that there's care and feeding on these custom apps. And actually that's the custom apps is an expensive process for people too. Yeah. So, yeah. But yeah, but they, I guess ultimately we're always in maintenance mode. Actually, I thought when you started this line of question, you're, you're like, uh, these apps are done. It's like, that's like saying that I found the last bug. Yeah. It's like, yeah, okay. Right. <laughs> no, right. you didn't. They're never done. These things live longer than you ever anticipate. Right. <laughs> you know, I, I had a one of my very early applications way back when I started my consulting business was for a hospital in Seattle where they scheduled interpreters. And we built this Fox wrap. It had like three screens to it. And like five years later, they called me and they're like, we need, to, we need some extra stuff added to this. And I'm like, you're running that thing still? It still works? <laughs> yeah. And they have band-aided it and they've had, there were memo fields and note fields. They put all these funky codes in to make it do extra stuff that you never intended it to do. Same thing happens today. I build tools that people build things with. So I have a, a manufacturing company in, in New York um, and they are on packing lines for food plants. They do pallet, pallet, palletizing and all that. So we yeah. built a tool where they could build screens with it. And I can't, I'm going out there next week, but I can't wait to see what they're doing with it. Um, but it's like, they can adjust barcode scanner or uh, uh, photo scanners yep. from our software now that I, I don't even know how they do it. It shows photos of the production line running. They've surfaced that up. It's this cool WPF app that I have no clue how they did any of this, but we built a tool to build tools with and they've done it. And I'm like, okay. Nice. You never know what people are going to do with your software either. That's the other thing is they, pe people are very resilient and very, Creative. very resourceful, right? Yeah, they will yeah. figure out how to make your software do stuff. That you never thought it was going to do. So. <laughs> awesome. Well, hey, as we, as we wrap up, um, are, are there any, if, if people are creating a brand new application today, they have the chance to do greenfield or do a replacement thing. Okay. All these problems, I've been mucking with code that I inherited, but now I get to build one for myself, and I'm not going to make all the mistakes that everybody else made, and then I had to inherit their code. Um, wh what types of uh, education or what, books or magazines or, or patterns, what should they be devouring right now so that they, uh, so that they, can, they can do their, their greenfield well? And um, I've got one. It's not sitting here right now. There's a new a new book out, and I want to pair. I want to preface this a little bit. So there's about a it's a, about a thousand eight hundred page book about from Google on how they build their development teams. Oh, a awesome. great book! I'll get. You, I'll have to get you the link to it. Okay. Um, I'm reading it, and I and I everyone I, I I have a hard time sitting down and reading a lot of these books back to back, or just finding the time to do it. But this one intrigued me because. There's team dynamics, um, and in terms of Google, their problem set is no nobody's problem set is like Google. Yeah, I'm just sorry, you're just never going to work in that space unless you work for Google or Facebook or one of the big giant companies. Yeah, the problem set that they have is is vastly different than the vast majority of developers that we deal with. Most of our apps, ninety percent of the stuff out there can be done with an ASP.NET Core app. Yeah. Without a lot of rigmarole, low scale. The vast majority of them, yeah, low low scale, simple, you know, easy. I don't need lambdas. I can do a load balancing anyway. There's lots of simple stuff. But yep. reading a tech, reading a book like this is great because it gives you an idea of team dynamics because they have giant teams, but they break down into smaller teams and they talk about how that works, how to communicate issues, how to add telemetry to your apps. And all so I'm just scratching the surface on the book. It's an amazing book. And then there's another one that I have. I wish I had them sitting here because this other one is one of the best software architecture books I've seen. It's very practical in nature um, and very surprising in some of the techniques. And I'll get you that one too. But it's a it's a it's a way a different way of looking at how to write code. And I, I, I and the name of it is just totally out of my head right now. Okay. Uh, but I'll get you I'll get you the links. But both of these books are really good because they they turn a lot of the things you have. So the, the engineering one turns kind of a lot of thoughts you have on its head. You know, things you think you think about code differently based on this book, okay. which I like, or architecture differently. So look in the show notes. We'll have the names and the links to both of those books in the show notes. Um, well, I, 
Rod, I really appreciate you coming back on the show. Um, it's always, it's always good to have you. And, uh, I know I'm sure as I was, the listeners are fascinated just kind of hearing, hearing your thought process. Cause you've got, you've got, you know, more experience, you know, dripping from your pinky finger than, <laughs> than a lot of people. So it's awesome. I enjoy it. It's, you know, it's, it's funny as it's still after 30 plus years of doing this, I still enjoy it. It's still fun, yeah. which is a really cool thing about it. It's like, I'm not, every day is not a grind. It's a fun, you know, we, we're lucky. We're lucky to be in this business because it's always, it's always interesting. Well, that's what I tell my kids. Cause I've three kids living at home. Find, find something that is out there in the market, obviously that you like to do that people will pay you to do. Don't just go finding something that that's a job that you have no interest in. The, the best trick you can play on life is to get somebody to pay you for something that you started out doing as a hobby. Yep, exactly. And you'll be happy every day. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, thanks again. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And until next time, keep shipping. You've been listening to the Azure DevOps Podcast, a show for developers and DevOps professionals shipping software using Microsoft technologies. Go to www.azuredevops.show for show notes and other episodes. On behalf of your host, Jeffrey Palermo, and our sponsors, thanks for listening, and may God bless you.